Hello, everyone. Today, I will be giving a talk on one of the greatest Bengali poets, Jivananda Das. And uh, let me begin by stating some of my interests and the idea of the kind of language I intend to use here. As someone who writes poetry in two languages, Bengali and English, more in Bengali than in English, and as someone who translates from several non-Western or non-European languages, and someone interested in exploring, exploding the conventional generic borders and boundaries, while also interested in enacting a dialectic between poetics, politics, and praxis. No, I'm not attempting to Marxianize Foucault, or for that matter, Foucauldianize Marx here. And as someone formally trained in the fields of English and comparative literature, I cannot but use more than one language in my talk here. In fact, I have to quote Jivananda Dash in Bengali, at least now and then, for I think translating some, if not all of his lines in English, runs the risk of perpetrating a sheer semantic and epistemic violence on the constitutively, irreducibly, and even the inscrutably poetic. Also, in the very spirit of Jivarando himself, one who is organically rooted in his soil and yet globally informed and engaged, I will range beyond the horizon of Bengali poetry sporadically. So here, Jivarando Dasha's own lines come to mind. I quote Jivarando, Freud, Marx, Gandhi, Lenin, Einstein, Erkrando Shite Aj, Jedor Kotin, Neimonehoi, Shedar Kuletabe, Manov, Tomai Shotto, Shujon, Prithibi Grahobashi Utehabe. Unquote. In other words, in these lines, as Jivananda Dash suggests, we got to be global. And Jivananda Dash's own injunction in his poem is tellingly titled, you know, Prithibi Grahobashi. I mean, the poem from which I quoted those lines in Bengali. Now, I move on to the second stream of my talk, which is an epigraph constituted by the lines written by none other than the great Russian poet Vladimir Mayakovsky. And I quote Mayakovsky here, our planet is poorly equipped for delight. One must snatch gladness from the days that are. In this life, it is not difficult to die. To make life is far more difficult. In my reckoning, Jivananda Dash is surely one of the greatest poets in the world, one whose words and works and words have by now proven to be hospitable to an infinite number of interpretations, so to speak. Of course, it is no news that Jivananda Dash was quite neglected during his lifetime. Initially, Rovindranath Thakur, Thakur did not take Jivananda Dash seriously at all. Rovindranath's first reaction, I quote in English translation, to show off strength is no sign of strength, rather its opposite, was, I think, patently harsh and even gruffly dismissive while Rabindranath's later reaction was blatantly brief, somewhat curt, but favorable, inadequately though, as Rabindranath only spoke of the pleasure of looking at Jivananda Dasha's poems, thereby pointing to the profusion and plenitude of visual images in his poetry. Even Kazi Nozrul Islam, my all time favorite poet, went to the extent of making fun of Jivananda Dash, saying something to this effect for Jivananda, metaphor is more important than mother. Jivananda Dash ar kovitai upama bhavar korten, ebong amra jani je upama bhavarer jonno Jivananda Dash prashitho 
তার নাম এই উপমা প্রসঙ্গে বারবারই আমরা ব্যাপার করি কিন্তু এই যে উপমা এটাকে ধরে নজরুল তাকে মজা করে বলেছিল যে জীবনানন্দ দাসের জন্য মায়ের ছে উপমাই প্রধান এই কথাটা এনিওয়েস এমং হিজ মোস্ট নোটেবল কন্টেম্পোরারিস নোন অ্যাজ দ্য গ্রেট মডার্নিস্ট অফ দ্য নাইনটিন থার্টিস সাচ অ্যাজ বুদ্ধদেব বসু সুধীন্দ্রনাথ দত্ত অমিয় চক্রবর্তী অ্যান্ড বিষ্ণু দে ইট ওয়াজ ওনলি বুদ্ধদেব বসু হু কেয়ার টু রিড জীবনানন্দ দাস অ্যান্ড ইভ্যালুয়েট হিজ ওয়ার্ক টু দি এক্সটেন্ট দ্যাট হি কোর্ড but i would still argue that his deep sympathy for jivanand dash notwithstanding even buddhadev by calling jivanand dash the nirjanatama kavi or the loneliest poet ultimately failed to do justice to jivanand dash's otherwise staggeringly mind bogglingly wide ranging poetic oeuvre say from his first collection of poems called jhara palok in english translation fallen feathers which was published in 1927 and his dhushor pandolipi in english translation gray manuscripts published in the year 1936 to bonolata shen published in the year 1942 and mohaprithivi in english translation the massive world that appeared in 1944 and shakti tarar timir in english translation the darkness of seven stars that appeared in 1948 to Jivananda Dasher Shreshta Kovita, the best poems of Jivananda Das that appeared in 1954 to his posthumous collections, such as Rupushi Bangla, in English translation, Beautiful Bengal, that was published, which was published in the year 1957, and Bela Obela Kalbela in English translation, In Time, Out of Time, and A Time Apart which appeared in the year 1961. Following Jivananda Dasha's death, however, there, there has been an incredibly prodigious, phenomenal explosion of critical works on him. Hundreds of essays and scores of books have already been written about his work, particularly, if not exclusively, his poetry. Well, of course, Jivananda Dasha has proven to be an unshakable undeniable, visible or invisible, direct or indirect influence on subsequent generations of poets. Today, critics and readers invoking Western figures or Western critical paradigms or approaches find in Jivananda Dasha's poetry all kinds of things, such as Donetsk conceits or Discordia concords, Keatsian sensuousness, Baudelarian, Mallarmian, Rambouillian, Verlainian symbolism, Poesk enigma and dream-like topos, Yetzian occultism and flair for the mythopoetic, even Frostian deceptive and dramatic simplicity, William Carlos Williamsian imagism and so on. One can go on and on here. The kind of synesthesia or what I wish to call intersensory experience that Baudelaire, for example, memorably and famously speaks of in his deeply aestheticized and beautifully crafted sonnet called, in English translation, Correspondences, was, was already exemplified in the work of Jivananda Dash, as the critic Alok Ranjan Dashgupta once pointed out. And of course, a whole host of critics have found in Jivananda the elements of many painting or arts-related movements or schools like Impressionism, Abstract Expressionism, Dadaism, Surrealism, Acmeism, Constructivism, Futurism, and then by the grace of contemporary literary theory emanating from the metropolis, critics have also found in Jivananda even Lacanian Christave and Jouissance, Derridian playfulness, and of course, the elements of what might be called anti-modernist modernism or even postmodernism. The list I have hitherto provided here, rather deliberately but quickly, is by no means exhaustive though, but, but it is intended to convey a sense of the bewildering textuality and intertextuality of Jivananda's work that all kinds of critics have by now pointed up one way or another. There are of course some broad thematic conceptual 
constellations and preoccupations in his poetry and critics have already named them in a great variety of ways. For example, the poetic registration of ennui and the experiences of alienation, existential crisis, and even the utter meaninglessness of life, as well as a Ionesco-esque, Eugene, Eugene Ione, Noesco-esque absurdity, anonymous melancholy, the tensions and transactions between the temporal and the timeless, reminding one of Dante's Il Panto Acqui Tutti Li Tempi Son Presenti, which is roughly translated as time past and time future are all contained in time present, something that T.S. Eliot also rehearses on a relatively different register in his famous work, famous poetic work called Four Quartets. And then you have even over-determined ecological consciousness, prehistory and history and geological time, geographical and cartographical imagination, even the subject of ideational mystification and obfuscation as can be particularly, if not exclusively, exemplified in his great but relatively unknown poem called Timir Shurje. Then the question of even Malarmian nothingness, war and peace, nocturnal romance, social conflicts, deep nostalgia, the corruption and hypocrisies of middle class politicians and businessmen, moral decadence in contemporary society, deadly pessimism, yet tremendous optimism, mark such lines as Jibon Tobu Niralok Hue Rabe Kotodin. From his interestingly titled poem called Onik Mrito Biplavi Sharone. Let me repeat the title here Onik Mrito Biplavi Sharone. And even the question of revolution itself as a theme, it is not only interesting, but also suggestive that Jivanananda Dash has used directly in his poetry the word Biplav or revolution more than a hundred times times, say from at least Mohaprithivi or the massive world or Shattitara Timir or the darkness of seven stars to Bela, Obela, Kalvela, you know, out of, uh, in time, out of time and time and the time apart, not to mention numerous poems discovered after his death. In any event, one can easily see that poetics, politics and philosophy profoundly intersect in the poetic spaces forged with boundless energy and elan and ekla by Jivananando, whom I cannot but compare to the greatest Latin American poet Pablo Neruda, the different locations, traditions, and stylistic signatures notwithstanding. Now I'll make some more general observations quickly about Jivanando Dash before I take up my own particular concern, which has to do with a relatively unheeded area of Jivanando Dash's work. True, Jivanando Dash has most effectively and influentially, influentially shaped the idiom of modern Bengali poetry, while his persistent concerns with the entire range of places and peoples and seasons of his own land fiercely bespeak his anti-colonial rootedness. Of course, it is possible to speak of the post-colonial Jivanandos as some have already done, although I'm not always with them. And then underlining his brand of poetics that challenges Eurocentrism at every turn. Indeed, Jivanandos relentless explorations of the historical and the unconscious accompanied by his explorations of the various rhythms of time and of different spatial contours and configurations and constellations have given his poetry the kinds of textures and vectors and valences as well as stylistic range and flexibility that were totally unknown before him. And despite their many differences, many differences, Jivanananda, like Pablo Neruda, offers the kind of poetry that responds to, I quote Neruda here, quote, 
the mandates of touch, smell, taste, sight, hearing, the passion for justice, sexual desire, a consummate poetry soiled by the pigeon's claw, ice marked and tooth marked, bitten delicately with our sweat drops and usage, unquote, while always marking, I quote Neruda again, the sumptuous appeal of the tactile, unquote. But, but could a poet like Jivananda Das be concerned with utterly unpoetic, even dully prosaic subjects like budgeting and banking, inflation and interest, even compound interest, income tax, royalty, commission, agency business, indenting business, the flow or circulation of and thirst for dirty money, the power and magic of money, the bloody exploitation of labor, even what Marx calls a fictive capital in the third volume of capital and the like in the very spaces of his own poems. Mark then Jivananda Dash's own lines, the ones that I feel compelled to quote in the original Bengali here. Committee meeting a boshe, kukurke, hard die, budget koreche gari gari bang shumai. Bathroom e tobuo, ondo snatok dhrito rastro chada, ar kichunai. Jivanandu dashet budget kapna. Committee meeting a boshe, kukurke, hard die, budget koreche gari gari bang shumai. Bathroom e tobuo, snatok ondo dhrito rastro chada, ar kichunai. And my quick functional translation, uh, sitting in on their meetings, they allocate those uh, damn bones to the dog, budgeting their wagons of meat. Also, these lines by Chivanananda, Uchu Uchu factory, bank nie unmuk progoti jege ache tomader grumpai. And in my translation, sky piercing factory after factory, anxious progress along with the bank remains wide awake. Do you feel sleepy? And there are more lines, of course. I quote Jivanananda, Bohu ke bonchita kore duak jon ki ak jon kine nite pare. Priti bite shut khate, shakolir jon na noi. Oni borchoniya hundi ak jon du jon hate. Priti virei shab uchu loke der dabi eshe shabi nai nadi keo niya jai. In my English translation, again quick functional translation, at the expense of the many, only an individual or two can buy. Interest remains invested in the world, but not for everyone. The unspeakable bill of exchange stays in a hand or two, and the demand of this world's upper class folks grabs every goddamn thing, women included. And more lines, and I can't resist quoting more lines here from Jivanananda, Kothai Shamaj, Orthodity, Shargabami Shiri Bhengegye, Pair Niche Rakta Nodir Moto, Manob. Kramo Purinotir Potilingo Shoriri, Hueki Aj Charidike, Gononahin, Dushor Deal, Churi Ache, Jejar, Doipo Shakur, Dahol Kore. Of course, there are more lines by Jivanondo. Mark his atypical diction here in these lines. Taraki Nirosh, come on, orthohin geometry, Moto. Bhagavan, Tobu geometry noi. Political economist noi. Professor Noy, Devota Rosher, Shitul, Shitol, Mujir, Devota She. And more lines by Jivanananda. Acti Poishar Jono, Acti Chele, Trame Chapapolo, Barbonitara Poishar, Ohabe, Rastai, Nemeshe, Jekono Rokum, Acta, Shikar Thorte, Rikshawalar Hatpa, Ondukare Vitor, Makroshar Mutaguche. Poishar binimoye, e prithibite jaki chupao jai, tari jonne chukche oi motor, king by prithibir jaki chupoisha pao jai, tari jonno. Here, Jivanananda, 
evidently accentuates the tyranny of exchange value. And for that matter, their utter, the utter subordination of use value to exchange value to redeploy Marx's own terms from his critique of political economy, although Jivananda Dash is by no means a Marxist. But the poet much more poetically underlines what Marx calls the power of money in a bourgeois society, which is actually the title of an entire chapter included in Marx's early major work called Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts of 1844. In any event, Jivanananda does not stop there. He writes an entire poem that mobilizes the discourse of money like this, and the poem is called Bonafide. मधु तर टेबिले छड़े रखते शक्ति के स्वीकार करी मे मानुषा पुरुष जीवन व्यवस्था के भलोबाशे तर दिए सतान सृष्टि हृदय प्रेम संचार कर शर के सृष्टिर पात्र कर तोले सतान घुरे फिर से कथाई बोले तर कथा माइने कथा इनक्रिमेंट रयल्टी कमिशन और इंटरेस्टर कथा चाल डाल दूध बाड़ी भरार कथा एक टाओ बस पेले खानिक खाँटी आनंद कथा एक टाओ कम पे खानिक खाँटी विषणतार कथा सब आंतरिकता दिए पृथ्वी The poem I have just cited is for me immediately reminiscent of the late 19th century. And I think I would do well before I make my points about the poems, about this particular poem called Bonafide, I think I would do well to provide at least a quick translation of some of the lines from that particular poem called Bonafide. And here are the lines, the kind, this is the kind of the world where people wax lyrical about money at every turn. And they speak again and again of the stonks system. Everyone able to pay income taxes is deemed damn important. The children speak of the same money. They speak of jobs, salary, increment, royalty, commission, interest, and they speak of pure pleasure if they end up receiving an extra penny. So the poem called Bonafide, I've just cited, is, is, is for me immediately reminiscent of the late 19th century Russian writer Anton Chekhov's short story called Gooseberries, in which a character ardently asserts, and I quote, and I use this quote whenever I get a chance, you know, whenever it comes to talking about money, I use this quote, is from Chekhov, I quote, money like a vodka can do crazy things. Unquote. But the poem significantly, if not directly, suggests how capitalism and patriarchy as systems of power relations and production relations remain profoundly interconnected. That is, patriarchy is capitalist and capitalism in turn is patriarchal. Further, Jivanananda's poetically and or even tropologically mediated way with the discourse of money affecting the practices of the everyday also reminds me of a whole host of politico economically engaged poets like of course the Chilean poet Pablo Neruda whom I quoted earlier, the Salvadoran poet Roque Dalton, even the Nicaraguan Marxist feminist poet uh, Gioconda Bailly, the Puerto Rican socialist feminist poet Julia de Burgos, and the African-American poet Amiri Baraka. Of course, they are all vastly different from one another, and they are also vastly different from Jivanonondo, but there are certain interesting 
intersections among them when it comes to engaging the discourse of political economy directly in the spaces of their poetic works. I think one can profitably undertake a comparative study of Jivananda Das and the third world poets I've just mentioned. Although, as you know, it has hitherto been customary to compare Jivarananda Das to canonical figures from the West, like W. B. Yeats, Edgar Allan Poe, and even Robert Frost. Here, owing to time constraints, I cannot get into the details of comparison, and that task, necessary as it is, does not constitute my purpose here either. In any event, I think I have hitherto provided just some quick symptomatic instances, but I argue that it is possible to show how his intricate calculus of images, as well as his direct poetic statements repeatedly, even if disquietingly, broach a cluster of issues such as the problematic of commodity fetishism, the ethos of buying and selling that decisively characterizes the practice of everyday life, the curious arithmetic of interest and inflation, the illusion of economic progress, reminding one of that famous statement made by the great Caribbean poet Derek Walcott, progress, progress is history's dirty joke. The ruthless exploitation of labor and accumulation of capital and so on and so forth. In other words, Jivarananda Das, I argue, could even mobilize the texts and tropes and tenors and terms of political economy, even in the spaces of poems themselves, unsettling the otherwise misleading characterization of this poet as a purist or as an esthete, one who as if remains indifferent to the dull prose of daily living. Of course, of course, the Jivanananda dash of political economy is relatively unfamiliar to us or even de-emphasized in contemporary criticism. And I argue that Jivanananda is even more political economically engaged in his prose work than in poetry, particularly in his short stories, relatively unexplored as they are by offering symptomatic and brief readings of two of his short stories I would submit that Jivarananda Das is one of the few creative writers in the world who powerfully and productively enact a dialectic between the aesthetic and the political economy. And that his poetic understanding of political economy variously informs and inflects much of his oeuvre that indeed looks forward to a world better than this one. Now I move on to the third, rather last, and concluding stream of my talk. Jivarananda Das, of course, wrote a number of remarkable novels, particularly worth mentioning among them are Mallowan, Shutirtho, Jalpai Hati, Biva, Nirupam Jatra, Jivan Pranali, etc. But here, my concerns are not with his novels. In fact, some, if not much, work has already been done on, on them. And I think more work needs to be done for sure. But what remain most unexplored are his short stories, numerous as they are. In my reckoning, Jivananda Das is a first-rate short story writer, even by international standards. There's something Chekhovian, Pushkinian, and even Laurentian about Jivananda Dasha's stories, many of which directly mobilize among, among many amazing elements, the themes and tropes of political economy, fashioning what might be called the poetics of finance. And of course, I should point out very clearly that Jivananda Dasha is also vastly uh, different from a Chekhov, from a Pushkin, and from a Lawrence, but then there are certain over intersections. So when it comes to the question of uh, mobilizing the tropes of political economy in, in, in fiction, in the spaces of fictional works, particularly short stories. So I will call attention to two short stories whose titles themselves are not only striking, but seem unparalleled in the history of Bengali short stories, Hisheb Nikesh, or Daily Accounting, and Kotha Shudu, Kotha, 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 repetition. 
five times or words, 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 words. Both are the stories, both the stories, both the stories were written in the aftermath of the Great Depression of 1929, when capitalism's crisis greatly affected not only the US, but the global economy by and large. Indeed, both stories, Hisheb Nikesh or daily accounting and Katha Shudu, Katha, 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 or words only, words, 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 the stories, these two stories advance a humorous yet devastating critiques devastating critiques of the ways in which business folks enact the cycles of their becoming and being in the world. Also, Jivananda Dash advances even a critique of Buddha Devian Babutai Bangla. Although this critique is not generally loudly pronounced, we find in his stories a well-orchestrated triangulation of tangential remarks, sarcastic retorts, and even aphorisms as we also find a humor, subtle satirical moves, ironic indirection, accompanied by the rhetoric of commendation in the guise of condemnation, elements that seem to be anticipating the guerrilla linguistics of the Moroccan writer, Muhammad Khairuddin. My reading of the stories indeed prompts me to submit that Jivananda Dash himself is, in his short stories, a guerrilla linguist in his own right. Mark then how Jivananda Dash introduces the main character Avanish in his story, Hishab Nikesh. So in my quick translation, I quote, he has just crossed 50, bald headed. He has yet a baby face, as if he's a baby of swollen cheeks, as if he's fucking innocent. Yet who the hell does understand? the damn complexities of business better than he does. His entire body is a classic instance of corpulence and opulence both. Overly plump, his flesh is like a cotton cushion. His cheeks resemble a cotton cushion. His lips themselves are cotton cushions. His nose is like a bowl made of wood or metal. His eyes themselves are two cotton cushions, unquote. As none other than Antonio Gramsci put it in one of his prison letters, and I quote Gramsci here, reputation creates the illusion of reality, unquote. And indeed, by deploying this cinematic technique of close-ups, Jivananda Dash here zooms in on the very body of Avanish, its obesity, its dangling fat, not only underlining the very ugliness that Jivananda finds utterly disgusting, but also underlining surpluses that the political economically conscious Jivananda later directly and dexterously relates to the accumulation of capital, not only capital, but amazingly enough, fictive capital, the kind of capital that cashes in on fiction rather than commodity production the kind of capital that Marx himself theorized in his major work, Capital. As Jivananda Das himself shows in his story, Avanish is not involved in any commodity production oriented business as such. Rather, abandoning the business of leather and pharmacy, he has finally immersed himself in what's called agency business, where money, where money directly brings and begets money. In Capital, Volume 1, in its Chapter 4, Marx presents the general formula of capital via a circuit of M-C-M prime, where M stands for money, C stands for the buying and selling of commodities, and M dashed stands for more money or profit. But Marx presents another circuit of capital, which is M dash M prime, meaning that money directly brings more money by passing the phase of commodity production, but decisively contributing to the accumulation of capital. Now, the Avarish of Jivananda Dash's story is involved in the M dash M prime circuit 
where the play of fictive capital is of paramount importance. Avanish's own story gathers momentum, revolving around M dash M prime, so to speak, as Avanish widening his baggy eyes and letting out a bad belch, talks to his friend Rakhal about a Yankee's coconut oil business's fiasco and his own net profit of two lakh rupees. Jivanando, in fact, shows how the entire mindscape of Avanish, including even its inscape and instress, to use the poet Gerald Manley Hopkins' terms from another context, are all inextricably tangled up in the M M prime circuit, such that even love and affection are all adversely affected as relationships between people morph into relationships between mere things, something that the Marxist theorist Georg Lukács called reification. Of course, Jivanando did not read Lukács, but with a creative writer's genius, Jivanando Das ably fictionalized the effects of both alienation and reification in his short story, something that even Manik Bandhapadhyay, despite his unusual creative power, could not do, as I would argue. Now, onto this story, Katha Shudhu. Katha, 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 Katha. Going to time constraints, I would have to skip quite a, quite a cluster of close textual analysis and make even some conceptual leaps. I will, in fact, make some quick points. The French Freudo Marxist theorist Jean Joseph Gou, in a seminal work called Symbolic Economy, theorizes the isomorphism or the similarities between money and language. Amazingly enough, well before Jean Joseph Gou, Jivananda himself does the same in the space of a story such that his Kotha Shudu, Kotha, 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 can be read money only, money, 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 or as M dash M prime dot, 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 N, nth degree. This story is also reminiscent of Anton Chekhov's story, Gooseberries, that I mentioned earlier, as it is also reminiscent of the great African-American poet Langston Hughes' short typographical poem about money, which is this, the golden goose laid. Dollar, 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 dollar. Yes, it is the movement of dollar, of money, or money, or more appropriately capital that consummately and even unmitigatedly preoccupies the totality of the becoming and being of the major character Bhavashankar in the story Kathashu. But who is this Bhavashankar? As Jivananda Dash introduces him, and I quote in my English translation, you know, quote, Bhavashankar is chairman of a pretty huge life insurance company, but at every meeting, his own secretary gives him shit, unquote. Jivananda actually uses the Bengali word padai here, something that seems to be hurting the sense of linguistic hygiene represented by the likes of Buddha Bosch. Parenthetically, I should point out that Jivananda Dash mobilizes a number of onomatopias or near onomatopias in his short stories. But what is onomatopia? It is a word that actually looks like the sound it makes, and we can almost hear those sounds as we read. Here are some words that are used as examples of onomatopoeia, slam, splash, bam, babble, warble, gargle, mumble, and belch. But there are hundreds of such words. For Jivanando, the list as provided by the poet critic Navarun Bhattacharjo is this, I quote, Halu halu, tosh tosh, pa pa, poo poo, he he, kuch kuch, chui chui, dui dui, gajakonda, dumpai, me potkano, gukkuri, padano, unquote. But let's return to Bhavashankar. Like Avanish, this Bhavashankar also does not do production oriented business. Rather, he is intoxicated with the idea of making money beget money. 
This Vabhushankar wets his lips in his hot morning tea, but when he sips it, he makes the kinds of weird sounds that only Jivananda Dash can describe. Vabhushankar loves to have his special jelly in his toast while sinking his yellow teeth deep into the heart of a boiled egg and then bites into his banana while thinking about cash, 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 cash only. As Jivananda puts these words in Bhavashankar's mouth, I quote in my own translation, if I stick to my business, there will be money, more money, more money, more money, and more money, unquote. Bhavashankar seems to be echoing Marx's M M prime. And of course, for the sake of the M M prime, Marx, Bhavashankar can go to any extent, even bordering on the schizophrenic. Indeed, it was Karl Marx who, by using Shakespeare, particularly the Shakespeare of Taiwan of Athens, shows by the Shakespeare of Taiwan of Athens, shows in his economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1848 what magic and miracles money can do. Marx uses, among other theoretical formulations and metaphors and images and symbols, one particular image to point to the power of money, one which I would put it, I would put this way. The power of money is such that it can make your mouth kiss your own ass. I think Jivananda Dasha brilliantly and even unprecedentedly captures this ass kissing moment in a short story called Katha Shudu, Katha, 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 which again can be read as money only money, 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 bringing money, market, magic, miracle, mind, and Marx together, so to speak. So I have hitherto presented a different Jivanananda, I hope, one who does not tally with some conventional characterizations of him. But I think more, more work on his short fiction still needs to be done. I'll stop here. Thank you for listening.